The father of the hydrogen bomb said that abandoning thorium was a mistake, and that a nuclear reactor running on thorium instead of uranium fuel would give us enough energy for thousands of years. And yet today, it's nowhere to be seen. So what went wrong? And with several companies speculating it is possible, is thorium poised to make a comeback? Let's dig a little deeper and find out what's really going on. Welcome everyone, my name is Michael, and there's been growing interest in a type of nuclear power that was first investigated in the 1950s and then essentially abandoned, thorium. Still, advocates say it's a superior alternative to uranium reactors operating today and seriously worth a second look. Like uranium, thorium is a heavy element mined from the earth that can be used in fission reactors, much like the ones we already have today. Both are used in a controlled chain reaction that creates heat and then spins a steam turbine and a generator to make electricity. From a practical high-level perspective, there is very little difference between uranium and thorium. The details are in the nuclear physics. Very simply, uranium undergoes the fission chain reaction directly. A uranium atom is struck by a neutron and fissions, releasing energy and additional neutrons that go on to strike other uranium atoms. Thorium, however, doesn't directly fission when it is struck by a neutron. Instead, it absorbs the neutron and then converts itself into a uranium atom. Then, when this new uranium atom is struck by a second neutron, it fissions and releases heat. This may not initially seem as efficient, but it turns out it is possible for much more of the thorium in a reactor to undergo this conversion to uranium and then fission compared to trying to fission the uranium atoms directly, as is done in conventional reactors. This means that instead of extracting less than half a percent of the available energy in a conventional uranium reactor before the fuel is thrown away, Advanced thorium-fueled reactors should be able to extract 40 or 50 times that amount of energy, meaning they're potentially much more efficient with the fuel. This means it requires much less mining and would make much less nuclear waste, one of the biggest downsides of using nuclear energy in general. It's because of this fuel efficiency, among other claims of improved safety and reduced nuclear waste, that advocates say that we should be giving thorium another look. But if thorium is so great, why don't we really see more plants using it? Or anybody using it? Well, it turns out we did use it. At least we tried. From 1965 to 1969, the United States operated what's called the Molten Salt Reactor Experiment at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. At the time, there were concerns about limited uranium supplies amid the expansion and construction of nuclear power plants that could consume the world's uranium reserves within a few decades. The idea was to explore options to use alternate or more efficient fuel sources like thorium. The creative design of this experiment used molten salt, or a liquid fuel, with mixtures of uranium and thorium rather than the solid fuels of conventional nuclear plants. The liquid fuel was pumped through the reactor where it generated large amounts of useful heat. The molten salt reactor experiment was more or less a success, demonstrating that thorium could be used as a viable fuel. Glenn Seaborg, the scientist who discovered plutonium and the chairman of the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission at the time, called it a success. Yet just a few years later, in 1973, the Atomic Energy Commission largely suspended funding for thorium reactors in favor of other designs that showed more promise at the time. So what went wrong? While the experiment demonstrated the feasibility of a thorium molten salt reactor, several problems with the design were found. The largest issue had to do with the integrity of the metal pipes that held the liquid fuel. A metal alloy called Hastelloy N was used to contain the fuel salt in the molten salt reactor experiment. Testing of the Hastelloy N surveillance specimens produced cracks in the grain boundaries of the salt exposed surfaces. Because of the depth of the cracking observed, the MSRE would not be acceptable when extrapolated to the 30 year design life. Essentially, fission products in the liquid fuel were attacking the pipe, causing surprisingly deep cracks to occur. And the metal wouldn't last as long as they would have needed in a much larger plant. This meant that any design couldn't be viable until further research into the materials could be done. The second major issue was the production and release of the highly mobile and radioactive isotope tritium. Because of the complex chemistry of using the liquid fuel, tritium production was fairly high. And because tritium particles are very small, they are very hard to contain, resulting in the unexpected release outside the reactor and into the environment. Once outside, Tritium often finds its way into the groundwater, where it can be detected using only specialized equipment. And if it is consumed by people by drinking the water that is contaminated, it can lead to a variety of health issues. Now, to be fair, the molten salt reactor isn't the only reactor design that produces tritium. Several operating plants, such as those in Canada, produce a fair amount of tritium, but over time they have learned how to manage it. Because of these issues, and a general focus on other designs, Progress on the thorium reactors largely stalled in the U.S. for the next 50 years, resulting in little attention outside the scientific community. However, in the past decade, things have changed. Renewed interest in nuclear power has also led to investigating alternative designs and fuels like thorium. 
Despite the challenges of the past, a number of companies and government research projects have started up recently to say that thorium deserves a second look, that the technology has advanced enough in the past 50 years to make it a viable alternative to the uranium-dominated nuclear industry. China is the furthest along, having started up its liquid-fueled thorium molten salt reactor in late 2022. The 2 megawatt test reactor is actually based on the U.S. molten salt reactor experiment, but hopes to demonstrate that the technology has progressed, and will actually lead to a much larger plant by 2030. China is also simultaneously building a solid fuel pebble bed thorium test reactor designed to determine the viability of this alternative approach. This means China is actively funding and building at least two different reactors based on thorium designs. India is another, and in an interesting position, having the largest thorium reserves in the world, but almost no uranium. Unlike many other countries, thorium reactors have been part of India's plans for decades to take advantage of this. The government adopted the three-stage plan in the 1950s for long-term energy independence. The first stage was heavy water reactors, which was accomplished initially through technology from Canada and then later domesticated. This has been a success with over 20 reactors operating and 10 more under construction. The second stage is breeder reactors, the first of which is expected to come online in 2023. These reactors are designed to produce plutonium to feed the third and final stage, using that plutonium to start reactors that eventually run entirely on thorium. However, this initial plan was enacted back in the 1950s and still has a ways to go. Because it will still take many years until it is fully on a thorium cycle, the Indian government has designed the advanced heavy water reactor as a parallel path. Although not a pure thorium reactor, it runs on mixed fuels, getting about 40% of its energy from thorium. This allows India to lessen its dependence on imported uranium and rely more on its own domestic thorium supplies. On the commercial side, several companies are fighting for position to create attractive designs. Somewhat similar to the Chinese test reactor, a company called Flybe Energy is designing a liquid-fueled thorium reactor that it says is inherently safer, simpler, allows online refueling, and produces 10,000 times less waste than conventional reactors. Also descended from the same molten salt reactor experiment, Flybe expects its design could take full advantage of the thorium cycle, allowing it to operate extremely efficiently and claiming a person's entire lifetime would fit into a piece of thorium the size of a golf ball. Thorcon is another company looking to design liquid thorium reactors, but their approach is to try and leverage the existing efficiencies of shipbuilding techniques. The idea is that by using existing components in manufacturing technology, the reactor could be built entirely at a shipyard and then transported to wherever it is needed. After eight years, the reactor would be shipped back to the facility for refurbishment and relaunch. Taking a slightly different approach, Copenhagen Atomics is looking to use existing stockpiles of spent nuclear fuel alongside thorium. Although to be fair, the spent fuel that they are referring to is mostly separated plutonium, but the marketing sounds pretty good. Nonetheless, the liquid fuel design concept should fit neatly into a standard 40-foot shipping container, which would allow for rapid deployment, particularly in remote locations. And these companies may clearly be onto something. Thorium provides an alternative fuel source to conventional uranium, more than doubling the availability of the raw fuel supplies. Add to that the extreme efficiency of the designs, which means the existing fuel supply could literally last thousands of years. Combined with other advantages and technologies, these designs can go further to improve safety and reduce nuclear waste. Another advantage should be the cost. Based on the efficient use of the fuel, the ongoing costs associated with obtaining more thorium should be much lower compared to conventional uranium plants, which need regular shipments of fresh fuel. And with many thorium designs operating at atmospheric pressures, construction should be much simpler as well. An analysis found the levelized cost of electricity for a general thorium molten salt reactor to be $53.51 per megawatt hour, compared to $63.08 for a conventional nuclear plant. For their floating design, Thorcon estimates the reactor to be between $30 and $50 per megawatt hour, depending on the size of the plant. Keep in mind that wind and solar range from $30 to $40, so even with the advantages of thorium, these plants are still likely to be more expensive than renewables, and they haven't been commercialized yet. However, if you're curious about levelized cost of electricity and why cost isn't everything, you should check out the video on small modular reactors. I'll leave a link down in the description. There are, however, still some challenges when it comes to using thorium, particularly in its liquid form. The issues of cracking and corrosion on the piping have greatly been reduced, but haven't been demonstrated over the full lifetime of the reactors. Many designs also need complex chemical processing to separate out the good fuel from the waste products, and all that liquid material is highly radioactive, meaning it is difficult to treat, and accessing components for maintenance becomes even more of a challenge. Even minor spills of liquid fuel could be extremely difficult to clean up. The problem of tritium production also hasn't gone away. Although certain methods can reduce the amount, it still poses a highly mobile danger, and clear environmental limits need to be set and followed. 
Finally, compared to the existing conventional reactors running on uranium, which together have accumulated over 10,000 years of combined operating experience, thorium reactors have collectively operated for really only around 50 years, if that. And most of these are small test reactors. This means the knowledge, training, experience, and infrastructure for fueling components is not nearly as well known for thorium, leaving it vulnerable to surprises, even if things look very good on paper. Use of thorium will depend on how well these issues can be solved. And like I said, there is no shortage of enthusiasm for developing thorium technology. Although sometimes it sounds too good to be true. Check out this video to see the biggest myths surrounding thorium that too many people believe. Subscribe if you want to stay up to date on more content like this, and thanks for watching.